Hello, good evening. My name is Charlotte Potter Krasik and I am the interim director here at the Barry Art Museum. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's presentation. The Barry Art Museum opened its doors in the fall of 2018. It houses the personal collection of Dick and Carolyn Barry, the biennial rotating exhibitions and new acquisitions. The museum serves as one of the many cultural icons of Norfolk, Virginia and sits as a gateway to the Old Dominion University. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our collection, exhibitions, and programs. The Barry Art Museum collection houses an incredible uh, archive of American modernist paintings, including the still life with the flowers, as well as incredible marine art. We also have strong holdings in contemporary glass sculpture from the studio glass movement up to present day with pieces like this by Monir Farmak Barmanian. And finally, we have historic dolls and automatons with pieces like this beautiful Miss Hiroshima friendship doll and then automatons which acted as the precursor to robots. We have a number of changing exhibitions at this time. Today, we're here to celebrate Orchids, Attraction and Deception, which is an exhibition which explores the allure of uh, the botanical fascination, colonization, global warming, and all kinds of different topics surrounding the somewhat um, maybe usual seeming flower that then suddenly is the tip of the iceberg for so many other topics. This image here is by an artist named David Willis who created the piece specifically for this show using small little bits of glass that he scatters across the surface and this suspends in a polymer. Currently we have Pandemic, reflecting on a year of quarantine. It's a pop-up exhibition with five different um, contemporary artists that are responding to different ways in which the pandemic has touched their life in the past year. And then some pieces that were made prior to the pandemic that are recontextualized as we look back. This fall, we have Karen Lamont, uh, Theatre de la Mode. It's a series of contemporary artist and sculptor Karen Lamont's one third scale sculptures. And you'll see them recontextualized a little bit um, in the custom made theater sets from the Old Dominion University Theater Department. And finally, we have Luke Jerem's Museum of the Moon, a three-day pop-up exhibition from October 15th, 16th, and 17th. Uh, this is not to be missed. It's a massive moon sculpture that will be suspended in front of our museum. All of these are free and open to the public. So here are just a few of our free programs. We offer multimedia tours, which I encourage you to uh, sign up for on our website. We can broadcast them anywhere in the world. They're completely customized. We have over five topics that we touch on, including uh, collection highlights, African-American voices in the collection, early education and animals and colors, 
um, orchids, and then our doll collection as well. We offer art inspired yoga, completely free um, every other week. It's 30 minutes, it's on our YouTube channel. It's really fun um, and it's a great way to relax and unwind. We also have these incredible act home activities which you can download directly from our website. Anything from paint by numbers to memory cards, uh, coloring books and even a paper doll collection. But this evening we're here for the Cross Pollination Lecture Series, which is featuring Brendan Baylor, one of the contemporary artists that's in the exhibition, the Orchid Attraction and Deception Exhibition, as well as Dr. Peter Weiss Jackson. Um, I'm gonna take a second to introduce Brendan. Uh, he is also a professor here at Old Dominion University in printmaking, although he's really an interdisciplinary artist that works in a lot of different media, depending on the subject matter that he's tackling. Um, he's very conceptual in that way. He doesn't necessarily use a media that isn't specific to the idea that he's trying to convey. Brendan Baylor grew up in the Pacific Northwest, taking in the sights and sounds of the wetlands next to his childhood home. As an interdisciplinary artist, his work explores landscapes as social, historical, and ecological spaces. His work has been shown nationally and internationally in many venues, including the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art, the University of Richmond Museums, and the Kona Institute in Sylvania. Brendan is currently an assistant professor of art with print media at Old Dominion University, and he lives and works right here in Norfolk, Virginia, at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. More of his work can be seen at www.brendanbaylor.com. So Brendan, welcome. Thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you. Oop, you're still muted. Sure am. <laughs> Thank, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited. I'm starting to talk before I unmute myself. Uh, great. <laughs> We're thrilled to have you. I'm going to turn off my video and take it away. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Charlotte, for organizing this. Um, and of course, the Barry Art Museum, Museum for hosting us. Uh, it's really an honor to be in the show. And uh, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. So if you haven't gotten a chance to see it in person yet, it's really it's really nice. They did a great job with that. So I am here to talk about uh, talk about my work in the show. So I was really excited to be included in this show. Uh, I've been working with images of tropical greenhouses and orchids for a few years. As Charlotte mentioned, you know my my work is primarily about my relationship to place connecting my experiences and landscapes with the large web of social and biological relationships that permeate it. And so what that means kind of generally is that I make work about where I live. Um, so I wanted to take some of my time here tonight to introduce myself, to contextualize the work in the show and talk about what attracted me to making these orchid prints. Um, I'm also gonna introduce a couple of ideas that I think will help to inform our conversation um, you know, between Charlotte, uh, Peter, and myself later on. Um, so um, this is an image of the uh, Orchid Conservatory here on campus at ODU. So uh, I moved to Norfolk in the summer of 2017 to take my current position at ODU. And whenever I move somewhere new, uh, which is something I've been doing a lot in my adult life. I try to find spaces where I can connect you know, with what is exciting and energizing uh, about a particular place. And so for me, living in Virginia, uh, that's been the botanical gardens and greenhouses uh, of the East Coast. Now, I grew up on the West Coast and um, I didn't spend that much time in tropical greenhouses. There are you know, botanical gardens and conservatories uh, on the West Coast, but there really aren't in the same abundance um, as they are here. And so for me, you know, these were both compelling visual spaces and, you know, these somewhat unfamiliar cultural objects. And so I began to research and explore these, these spaces um, and kind of look at them using that same ecological lens that I uh, usually would use on landscapes. Um, and so around the same time that I started kind of uh, looking at and thinking about these orchid houses, 
I was invited to participate in an exhibition called Imaging Utopia. And basically this was an exhibition and a, and a portfolio of prints that was um, exploring the idea of utopia. And in particular, um, this idea that like one person's utopia can be another person's dystopia. And so, you know, as part of my process as an artist, I often take these walks um, and they're kind of aimless and um, they help me, uh, moving my feet helps me to also, you know, move my thoughts. And so as I was thinking about this theme, um, I found myself walking into the Orchid Conservatory where I would often you know, spend time. And so as I was kind of walking through the space, I realized that a lot of these paradoxes that we were thinking about with utopia and dystopia were there um, in the space with me. Um, you know, so this is a, a building devoted to um, mostly tropical plants um, that are you know, primarily from the global south and yet, um, and so for them, you know, it's a it's an amazing utopian environment. And then, of course, you know, this is the exterior of the building. I would walk around the side, and there would be, you know, many native uh, Virginia plants that were not, you know, included in this idea of care in this space of care. And you know, at the same time, in the larger national context, this is 2017. And so immigration and the border wall were in the news and they were really looming large in my mind as well. And so it seemed ironic to be in this um, kind of amazing building devoted to tropical plants from the, the global south while um, you know, our country was trying to make it harder for people from the global south who were um, oftentimes refugees from uh, you know, displacement from climate change um, you know, we were making it harder for them to come in. And so there was a kind of irony there. You know, and of course, I was also attracted to these spaces because they're very beautiful. And that certainly didn't hurt anything. Uh, oftentimes, there's this kind of condensation and humidity that will happen inside of the tropical greenhouse um, that makes these kinds of fogs and mists and visual effects that I thought were really compelling and that show up later on in the prints that I've made. Uh, you know, my questions were really the thing that kept me going. And, you know, I, one of the questions that really stuck in my mind was how does this legacy of collecting, um, which has roots in consumption and colonization, uh, how does that relate to the present and ongoing ethic of care that's embodied in the garden? And so, you know, with these kind of paradoxes in mind, I set out to make some work. So this is the first piece, oh, Orchid House One. This is the first Orchid House print. And this is where I kind of started figuring out my working method for, for these prints in this series. So here I combined uh, an inkjet print and silkscreen printing to map my imagined roots of uh, the biological specimens that I found in the tropical greenhouse in Norfolk and map their connection to these um, biological preserves in the global south where they're often found. Um, at the same time, the political borders on the map as well as the border wall are burned into the paper using a laser engraver. So this is a machine that essentially uses light and heat to um, create uh, images and to remove and vaporize material. So if you get a chance to see this piece in the museum, you can see that it actually has a sculptural surface. And um, there are some parts of the paper where um, the laser actually burned through. And so there are these voids uh, you know, inside the piece as well. So here you can see the um, here you can see the inkjet print of one of the photos that I took from inside the space. And you can kind of see this kind of mist and humidity and fog that I was talking about earlier. Uh, you can see overlaid and kind of suspended above it are the map that I made, which had hand-drawn silkscreen stencils. So I actually traced over these maps by hand in order to reproduce them. Um, and this gives you a little bit of a, more of a close up on those burned political um, borders that I was talking about earlier. Earlier, you can see here 
uh, this in this final detail shot, you can see the the way that the paper is vaporized. And you know, I tend to use the laser in these prints and in my work as a kind of metaphor for you know a, a real world violence that kind of uh, unfolds in the surface of the paper. You know, and while it's worth saying that the violence on the border um, that was then and is currently ongoing is very present, you know, much of the collection of specimens that we're talking about um, in these tropical greenhouses is historical and it occurred in the past. And so, you know, part of the, the, the tension here in, in these spaces um, is this kind of legacy of colonialism. And I think it's also worth saying that that's not um, unique or special to tropical greenhouses or botanical gardens. You know, this is this is our country, right? You know, I'm coming to you and speaking to you from land that um, I believe was home to the Chesapeake um, Nation, which is part of the Powhatan Confederacy here in the Chesapeake Bay. And so, you know, the room I'm in right now is literally a legacy of colonialism. So it's not to say that the greenhouse or the botanical garden is, is bad or wrong is, or is particularly um, colo colonial, but rather that um, these kind of legacies exist in many of the spaces of our lives. And so part of what I'm trying to do as an artist is to kind of think about um, how do we move forward with that, you know, and how do we, how do we make choices and how do we be in the world and how do we see that world um, given, given those histories that we live with and that we embody, uh, our, you know, ourselves. And, and, and as I was thinking about colonialism and the global south, I was also thinking about climate. And so this next piece you can see this kind of iceberg, this like ghostly iceberg looming over the conservatory, sort of giving a, a visual form to these anxieties that I have. Being in the greenhouse, you feel immediately as you walk in this like concentrated heat. And I couldn't help but thinking about, you know, our warming planet while I was in the space. And, you know, when I was learning about climate change as a child, it was termed the greenhouse effect. And so, of course, that also came into play um, as I was um, exploring these, these spaces. Here's a detail shot where you can see kind of this overlap between the visual space of the photograph and this kind of imaginary space of the iceberg. And so I wondered, you know, what does it mean to operate the space of care for tropical plants that's consuming energy uh, whose production exacerbates climate change? Um, and this energy production could potentially be um, endangering those home ecosystems um, in the tropics. On the other hand, you know, how do you get people to care about these plants and these landscapes when they haven't experienced them? You know, being in this space and having this physical relationship to these plants is a very compelling experience. Um, and it's very beautiful. And I think I captured some of that, um, some of that, um, you know, visual uh, aesthetic pleasure in, in the print and in the photo. You know, and, and so what does it mean for us to, to, um, to operate these spaces? And again, this isn't just about tropical greenhouses. You know, these are thinking ecologically challenges us to really examine our society on a basic level, you know, and I'm sure that if 100% renewable energy options were available, um, for, you know, ODU that we would be taking them immediately. So, you know, it's definitely um, not just about, you know, our individual choices, but, you know, kind of how we are in the world collectively. Okay. Uh, this is the, the final print in, from, the, uh, from the show in the very, um, this is dry corridor. And so here you can see we have this lush layered vegetation of the orchid house juxtaposed with these laser engraved images um, of drought corn. So you've got the uh, abundance and lushness of the greenhouse and then this kind of deprivation and drought of the landscapes where some of these plants um, are, are, are uh, make their home. All right, 
Um, here's a detail of the map overlaying the photograph. So again, this is another process where I hand traced out um, all of this um, mapping and then printed it on top. Um, in addition, I, in this piece, I began to kind of make the pixelation of the digital print that you can see in the corner, bring that forward as well as an element. And through both of these processes, I was trying to produce the image in a way that implicated me as an artist within that space. You know, and you can see that here in the, um, you know, laser engraved image of the corn. So again, I'm directing this process, you know, I'm the one who's choosing to um, uh, unleash this kind of heat and light um, on this on this piece of paper to create an image, but also to destroy part of it, you know. And so again, um, you know, I'm embedded within it. I'm not outside of these things. I'm within them, you know, just like all of us. And again, um, so this image is the dry corridor. The dry corridor is a part of um, Latin America that's very prone or very sensitive to um, variations in rainfall. And so a lot of um, crops are grown there. And it is um, a space where many people are subsistence farmers. And so, you know, if it's an inch or two of rain that will make or break your harvest, um, if you have drought for many years on end, um, people just simply can't sustain themselves. And so this kind of was came out of the research for the first print where I was thinking about like, where are people, why are people coming here from, you know, Central Latin America? And, um, and like, what are the processes that are, um, that are fueling that process? Great. And so this brings us to this idea that I think is gonna be really useful for us, you know, talking tonight and also has been really useful for me um, in my process as an artist. So when I'm thinking about colonialism, you know, I look to the writings of current, um, of people who have experienced colonization. Um, so again and again, you know, these authors and writers are asking us to decolonize ourselves, uh, our institutions and our society. And so I think botanist um, and writer Robin Wall Kimmerer gives us a really lovely metaphor for this process with her concept of naturalization. So this idea comes to us from botany and a naturalized plant is the plant from another ecosystem um, that rather than becoming an invasive species, uh, finds a balance within its new ecosystem. And she uses this as a metaphor for how those of us who are not indigenous to where we might live, we live, might cultivate a different way of being. And so I'm just gonna read a short paragraph from her. So she says, being naturalized to place means to live as if this is the land that feeds you, as if these are the streams from which you drink that build your body and fill your spirit. To become naturalized is to know that your ancestors lie in this ground. Here you will give your gifts and meet your responsibilities. To become naturalized is to live as if your children's futures matter, to take care of the land as if our lives and the lives of all our relatives depend on it because they do. And, and I just think that this idea is really lovely because, you know, it gives me hope and a way forward as somebody, you know, whose ancestors chose to have a destructive relationship to the land. Um, you know, this idea of like naturalizing and rooting yourself somewhere um, can shift our way of being and can give us a different way uh, of being in the world. Okay. Oh, and also this book is incredible and you should all read it. Uh, which, which brings us to the last um, project that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to uh, wrap it up real quick because um, we need to have time for our conversation. So uh, working with, after working with images of greenhouses, um, I had the opportunity last summer to create my own. So I made this project, maybe click the slide board. Uh, I made this project uh, with my colleagues uh, at ODU, Kelly Morse in the English department and Natalia Pilato in our education. So this is Hot House. This is a participatory uh, sculpture project where um, images depicting aspects of climate disruption were printed on the walls of this structure. Uh, paper vines printed with words uh, created by community participants uh, hang within. And so there's a lot of imagery 
um, on the structure relating to climate change. Um, I'm not going to break it down too much because I got to wrap it up. Um, but this is a um, flood map of Norfolk. There's some, you know, um, uh, silhouettes of the species that were affected that are uh, Virginia species that will be affected by climate change. See them here. Inside the structure, uh, we hung these vines. And so on each of these leaves, um, community participants were invited to create a word that encapsulated some um, part of their experience of climate change, e either a feeling or an experience. And so this is an example of, of one of the prints. You can see more um, imagery wrapping around the sides of the space. A lot of these were taken from um, images of superstorm events that were fueled by climate change. It's gonna work quickly through. Okay, yes. And so, um, and so this was shown last summer at the Hermitage Museum um, here in Norfolk. And because of COVID, we weren't able to get um, the kind of much of the face-to-face in-person um, kind of conversations uh, and interactions that we wanted for the project. Um, so we have a, a web um, portal that you can participate in the project through. Um, there's a nice little wor writing workshop. And then we've digitally archived um, all of the responses. So if you want to participate in the project, you can check out hothouseartproject.com slash coin a word or just go to hothouseartproject.com. Uh, we're gonna be showing the vines from this project at the Chrysler Museum here in Norfolk um, later on this winter. So please participate and then we'll have the opportunity to um, put some of those new words into um, that installation. Um, I was going to talk about some other ideas, but I think we're gonna move on um, so that everybody else has time to talk um, and we can circle back around to that if it seems relevant. Um, Later on. Thank you so much, Brenda. And that was fantastic. Um, oh. Next, we are excited to introduce Dr. Peter Weiss Jackson. So, thank you for joining us, Peter. Peter Jackson is the president of the Missouri Botanical Gardens and George Engelman Professor of Botany at the Washington University in St. Louis. Born in Ireland, Weiss Jackson obtained a BA in botany and an MA from Trinity College in Dublin, where he was subsequently obtained a PhD to work on the taxonomy of the Iris crucifery. Crucifery, but that's fine. <laughs> in 1981, he was appointed the administer, administrator of the Trinity College Dublin Botanic Garden. In 1987, he moved to Kew to jo join the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, where he helped to establish the International Network Organization for Botanic Gardens that became the Botanic Garden Conservation International, the BGCI. In 1994, he was appointed the Secretary General of the BGCI and in 2005 returned to Dublin as the Director of the National Botanic Gardens in Ireland. In 2010, he was appointed to his present position at the Missouri Botanical Gardens. As one of the world's foremost and best known botanists and plants conservationists, Weiss Jackson has played an influential role in reshaping and leading the international botanic garden community over the past two decades. He's worked extensively with botanic gardens and their network organizations worldwide, helping to establish, develop botanic gardens and other organizations in over 30 countries. He'll speak to a few of those today. He's played a lead role in the development and implementation of the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, adopted by the UN Convention on Biological Diversity in 2002. He's been the chairman of the Global Partnership for Plant Conservation since 2004, and he was the co-author of the International Agenda of Botanic Gardens and Conservation, now endorsed by some 500 botanic gardens. Please join me in welcoming Peter Weiss Jackson. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, let me try and uh, share my screen. Hold on a moment. And while he's doing that, I do want to mention that we are taking um, Q and A's in the bottom of your own screens. You should see it at the bottom. Um, it's a little uh, area down there. So over the course of this presentation, I've noticed some questions have already popped up. Please do put them in there and we'll address them at the very end. Thank you. 
<laughs> Great. I hope everyone can see that now. Uh, Charlotte, everyone, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and it's a real honour to be asked to, to speak uh, at this um, webinar uh, this evening. Uh, and um, I'm, unfortunately, I've not yet had an opportunity to, to visit the Berry Art Museum, but I hope that will happen before too long. And I would uh, dearly love to see the, the wonderful orchid collection in your conservatory of uh, Old Dominion University. What I'm going to talk about uh, for, for a few minutes is uh, something to put in context uh, how botanic gardens of the world have evolved and how they have taken on a task to conserve the plant diversity of the world, which is essentially our heritage. Uh, I'm, the sort of summary of what I'm going to say is talk about their origins and the changing focus of botanic gardens. I also want to, to talk about how plant conservation has been become a, an overriding botanic garden responsibility and how we can link uh, plant conservation with the essential role that plants play in our lives and in the achievement of sustainable development. And, and I'll finish with saying something a little bit about my own institution, the Missouri Botanical Garden, and how that has uh, worked to develop its responsibility going from being a historic garden to a garden to support needs for plants all around the world. We sometimes forget, really, and take plants for granted, and we forget that they are uh, the fuel that drives life on the planet, and that without plants, uh, none of us would be here, uh, no other animal species would be here, and that they provide the basis of most terrestrial uh, organisms, and so we better darn well uh, look after them. And but before we talk more about that, let me say something about what are the roots of botanic gardens. Well, the, the first uh, European botanic gardens, which are generally regarded as being the, the beginnings of what are botanic gardens today, were in, in Europe. They arose uh, at some of the great universities of Europe uh, in the middle of the Renaissance, and uh, the earliest one was established in Pisa by the University of Pisa in 1543. Uh, and then the oldest existing botanic garden is in Padua, also in Italy. And you can see on my slide that I've put the, the names of some of the uh, earliest botanic gardens generally associated with universities where they were created by and large to, for university teaching and particularly to teach uh, medicinal plants. They were physic gardens to, to train students who became medical doctors and they have evolved from those early, uh, early roots. The ones in tropical botanic garden, the, the ones in tropical countries had very different origins and they were largely established to as, assist in colonial expansion by the great European powers, the United Kingdom, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Spain, Portugal. They created botanic gardens as uh, gardens to help import some of the, the plant species that became the mainstays of tropical agriculture, the crops like rubber and oil palm and tea and coffee and so on. Uh, and uh, those, most of those gardens still exist today, but they have very different uh, roots. The, well, the plant I show here is a, a remarkable one, not uh, a tropical crop, but it is the, the largest unbranched inflorescence of any plant in the world, Amorphophallus titanum, the giant uh, Titan arum uh, from Sumatra in Indonesia. And it's grown by the, the Bogor Botanic Garden, the, the earliest botanic garden, one of those early tropical botanic gardens in Indonesia. But the, the earliest botanic garden in the Americas uh, is in St. Vincent, and that was established in 1759, still there today. It was established to bring in uh, crop plants to help in colonization and of, of the island of St. Vincent and other Caribbean islands. And indeed, it was a, a, 
30 years later, it was due to receive the breadfruits uh, from Captain Bly's ill-fated expedition when he went to uh, when he went to the South Seas and came was coming back with um, uh, breadfruits as which would become the food for slaves. Uh, and his later expedition actually brought breadfruits to the St. Vincent Botanic Garden. But that garden now still exists and provides uh, a home for so many of the important economic plants of St. Vincent. Uh, and uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a fine, fine garden. But since then, there has been an extraordinary growth in the number and diversity and distribution of botanic gardens worldwide and their purpose. Uh, in the When I first began my career in botanic gardens, the international directory of them contained uh, 798 botanic gardens, and that was published in 1983. And you can see from my graph here that there has been uh, this extraordinary growth in the number of botanic gardens over a, a 35 to 40 year period. It's been driven largely by a growth in the need for botanic gardens and therefore uh, and a growth in the purpose of them. They've shifted from growing primarily exotic plants from around the world to focusing in many cases on native plants, but also in providing a showcase for uh, plants and the environment. Uh, and they have moved on to, to take on extraordinary uh, responsibilities in plant conservation. One country uh, which I spent time in is Brazil, and that in 1938 had three botanic gardens. Today it's got uh, between 40 and 50. You can see the beautiful on the uh, beautiful Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro Botanic Garden, uh, established in 1808, and today is a center for so much of the planning of uh, the conservation of Brazil's plant species. Brazil has more plant species than any other country in the world, something over 50,000 species. And we can see what a, a remarkable way that botanic gardens have grown with botanic gardens now in at least 175 countries and territories around the world, uh, about three and a half thousand gardens. And these are just some of the pictures of some of the ones that I've had the privilege of visiting. The oldest tropical botanic garden uh, in the world is the Pamplemousse Garden on the island of Mauritius, again established for um, bringing uh, sugarcane and other species to that island in the Indian Ocean, and today growing many of the native plants of Mauritius. It has they've grown to become a remarkable network uh, spanning the globe. And the, 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 the reasoning behind this is that if one can bring botanic gardens together to have a common purpose and a common uh, role uh, to preserve and cherish and nourish plant diversity and raise public awareness about the importance of plants, then if they are spread throughout the globe, they will be able to uh, play an amazing part in conserving our plant heritage for the future. One of the issues, of course, that arises is that where many of the botanic gardens are today uh, is not the place where the most native plants occur. On this map, you can see in the dark areas, these are the parts of the world, the tropics, which have the richest uh, diversity of plant species. And many of the uh, parts of Europe and North America and Australia uh, uh, have have smaller diversity of plant species. But we have to forget that it's many of the places where there are the most botanic gardens, where there is the most consumption. And so we need people to be aware of the importance of plants and the need to conserve them anywhere in the world, not just in the regions where there are the most plant species. And we do face a, a really serious uh, situation for plant diversity. There are about uh, 400,000 plant, 400, plant species known worldwide, and they are facing huge threats from habitat loss, deforestation, climate change, uh, 
unsustainable agriculture, invasive species, and many, many other, other reasons. A quarter of all of the plant species of the world are threatened with extinction in the wild today. And that will continue if we are not successful in uh, preserving them through botanic gardens and preserving their, their habitats. And it is encouraging, though, that in over the last two decades, the international community has realized that plants hold a special purpose for us and, and uh, our, our well-being. And so the, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity adopted in 2002, first of all, a global strategy for plant conservation and a series of targets on what needed to be achieved for plant conservation over these decades. Well, the strategy has come to an end at the end of 2020, but is now being negotiated to be extended for a further 10 years, because while many achievements were made in the strategy, most of the targets uh, failed to be reached. And that is where we need to raise our game and make sure that we will achieve targets that are set by now almost every country in the world to conserve their biodiversity through that convention and specifically plants. We are fortunate that we have a, a network organization, Botanic Gardens Conservation International, uh, founded in 1987 to bring botanic gardens together for that unified purpose, uh, working in conservation, education, sustainable development. Because we can't see plant conservation as being a separate issue from so many of the, the world challenges we face. We know that uh, to achieve sustainability, the world will have to address poverty. It will have to address hunger, uh, the, the well-being of, of, of the seven, nearly eight billion people uh, on the planet. The, it will have to ensure that there is quality education and gender equality. And all of these seven point, 17 points are the, the global goals of the Sustainable Development Agenda, which was adopted in 2015 to be achieved by 2030. And indeed, now, for the first time, biodiversity has taken its place as a partner in achieving these global goals. goals. In previous uh, sustainable ag development agendas, biodiversity, the plants and animals and their habitats of the world were regarded as a separate, uh, separate issue. And uh, whereas now we realize that we will not achieve sustainability unless we integrate um, biodiversity and its protection and environmental protection into a sustainable development goal. And that should help us to do a better job in protecting our environment along with achieving so many of the other goals we have, have set. Uh, people increasingly come to botanic gardens around the world, and they're a great center for education. Uh, and we can spread a word and raise awareness of the importance of plants. My own institution, the Missouri Botanical Garden, was established in 1859 to be a beautiful garden and a scientific garden for the people of St. Louis. But it has grown to become uh, one of the leading botanic gardens in the world, which feels it has a responsibility to partner with botanic gardens and other institutions throughout the world to uh, support uh, education work plant science and conservation, and to promote sustainability. It has huge collections and those become the basis for so much conservation work and scientific research. For example, uh, we have collections of about 17 and a half thousand different species and varieties, which are seen not as anything like a, a stamp collection of diversity, but they're to support uh, ensuring that we will not have species disappearing into extinction. These three uh, beautiful slipper orchids are all uh, endangered species that are maintained in our collection.
But we've tried to reach out beyond uh, Missouri and beyond the United States to have programs supporting communities and institutions in other countries. And one of the countries where we've got uh, a major program is in Madagascar. Uh, we have about 150 staff working for the garden in Madagascar, and we've helped local communities to set up uh, nature reserves uh, in throughout the, the island of Madagascar. You might say, why? Why Madagascar? Well, it is a country which is... Uh, small compared to the United States. You can see here uh, the size of Madagascar that I've overlain on the, on, the, uh, on the United States map. So you can see it's a, it's a relatively small country and it is one of the poorest countries in the world in terms of its uh, gross national product. But it has one of the richest floras in the world. Here in the in North America, we have about eighteen and a half thousand plant species. Madagascar has uh, fourteen thousand plant species that are known, and more are being found um, every every year. And unless they are preserved in in protected areas and also in cultivation, uh, we will be documenting the disappearance of Madagascar's flora, which is part of our world heritage. We are all part of this one planet. We don't have an alternative planet to go to. And so we are not on our own in any one country. We have to combine our efforts to ensure that we achieve sustainability wherever we are. Our own backyards are uh, certainly a part, of, um, a part of Madagascar. Let me see if, okay. And so that's one of the reasons why the garden uh, is working to support communities around the nature reserves that we've helped those communities to set up. Building sustainable communities so that the people in them have uh, good educational opportunities, have health centers, have economic um, uh, activities that they can do, because otherwise, the forests that are on their doorsteps will disappear like so many others with slash and burn agriculture and will not be there as the great resources they are for the future. The, the COVID pandemic worldwide has been a, a really difficult time for so, so many uh, and continues to be. And indeed, um, uh, just to finish with, we realized that in Madagascar, the impact of COVID, uh, not only on the people, was having an impact on the forests too, because so many small farmers are growing vanilla as a cash crop. And during the pandemic, they have no, uh, no access to international markets for the, the vanilla pr production. And so we have worked uh, to set up uh, new green jobs to support those communities uh, in and around the, the protected areas where uh, rather than have people go in and cut down the rosewoods and the ebonies and take, uh, take unsustainably from the forests, the, some of the last forests that are left in Madagascar. And the European Union gave us $100,000 from COVID emergency funds, and we've been able to support a thousand families. And so the, really the message is that unless we work together in sustainable development, work with our communities, the plants that we know are important to us now and in the future will disappear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent. Um, we're receiving some questions from the crowd and I think I might just start out by reading some back to you. Um, although I have a lot of my own as well, I wanna make sure that we get to the public. So um, the first one is, says, hi, Peter. Thank you for sharing your wealth of information about botanical gardens and how important they are. And I agree with you about the vital role of plant life for earth to be a proper home for animals and humans. You mentioned that we don't have, to have anywhere to go. Do you feel that the human population growth and growing demand for natural resources is a threat to plant life. Please elaborate. Thank you. Well, certainly the, I mean, when I was born, and I'm not really that old, there were, um, there were only a couple of billion people on the planet. Uh, 
there are now nearly 8 billion, and that is projected to, to grow to 10 billion. And, and we, we certainly are living well beyond our means in terms of, of how much, what size the human population can be supported by the planet. There is, a, uh, there is a measure that shows that perhaps in July of each year, we actually use up all of the, uh, the, the, what we should be using in terms of natural resources for the planet. So we are living well beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. And so we have to find ways of achieving sustainability. Um, and um, population, if it continues to grow at the speed it is now, uh, we face even greater population pro problems. Okay, the next question is for Brendan. Unless Brendan, did you want to respond to that at all? Oh, I just wanted, yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, part of the reason why I'm bringing in, um, you know, Robin Wall Kimmer to our conversation, who's a, a member of the Potawatomi Nation, so she's an indigenous person and a scientist, is because I think the question of raw numbers that people kind of, um, uh, obscures from the, um, the, the the quality of how we live rather than the quantity of the number of people. And so I think it's easy to just say there's a lot of people, but how many, but how are we consuming? How are we structuring our societies, you know? And so a lot of people will say, rather than focus on population, let's focus on like how we're living in the world and how we are in the world and how we consume and how we structure our societies, how we power our societies. And that when we focus on those things, then we um, allow there to be space um, for, for more people and for people to come after us because we want, we want that to be an option as well. So, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting shift too. Um, let me get to this other question and then we'll circle mm -hmm. back to that. So hi, Brendan, I viewed your work on your website and I really appreciate you bringing attention to the native lands and environmental factors involved with industrialization and modern capitalism. You just mentioned in this lecture about the unique, uniqueness of individual utopian perspectives. Do you feel the same way about sovereignty? Please elaborate and thank you. Mm. Yeah, sovereignty is, is such an interesting um, concept and con conversation. Um, and I think, I'm not, so I'm not 100% sure about the context um, uh, that, the, that the question um, asker is, is coming from. Um, but, you know, before I lived in Virginia, we lived in, um, in northern Wisconsin, and there's a whole lot of Ojibwe folks up there. Um, we were, we lived in Ashland, Wisconsin, and we're on the Superior, and there's four, you know, reservations around us. And the question of um, sovereignty was a really important one because the lands that we were living on up there um, were treaty lands. And so there were certain um, rights that the Ojibwe people had uh, reserved in perpetuity to hunt, fit, fish, and gather on the land. And so um, their sovereignty and their right to sustain themselves through their traditional practices was often used in conjunction with and as a part of environmental struggles in order to provide a legal um, backing for um, these, these social movements to um, end certain kinds of mining. I think it was sulfide mines up there. Um, right before we moved up there, there was a large struggle over an open pit iron mine, which was basically like ripped up. Um, it would have been the largest uh, open pit um, mine, I think in North America, um, if it had been approved. And so through a kind of alliance between um, native folks and environmental activists, um, there was, there was um, you know, they were able to stop these major damaging projects. So I think sovereignty, when we think about it in terms of like um, self-determination for indigenous people and for colonized people, I think um, that often results in um, less destruction and a more sustainable way of being. You know, right now there's a big struggle around the Enbridge Line 3 in Northern Minnesota. Um, and again and again, you know, indigenous land and water protectors who are, um, you know, using their, their tribal sovereignty um, and, and the rights that they have over their ancestral lands, like those are people who are, who are stopping fossil fuel development and who are making more space um, for, you know, my children 
to, to, to live in a world that has less fossil fuel development and potentially less catastrophic climate change. So if that's the perspective that you meant in terms of sovereignty, then I, then I think it's a very important concept um, you know, and one that shouldn't be overlooked. So hopefully that relates to kind of what you were thinking about. Um, yeah, well. absolutely. And you know, on a personal level, listening to both of you guys, I kept on getting struck by this interesting relationship between botanical gardens and museums. Mm. Um, they're both these cultural institutions that are that have this like immense responsibility, colonial responsibility, you know, by nature. But like we we collect, we must collect. What do we collect, and why do we collect, and who decides what we get to collect? Um, and then we have to conserve what we then collect. And there's this whole responsibility around that. Um, and so I wasn't sure if you guys wanted to speak a little bit about sort of this nexus and this way that art and science sort of come together in these two cultural institutions and how they sort of are similar and maybe how they're they're different. Perhaps uh, Charlotte, if I could uh, jump in uh, and really uh, add to what um, what was said about sovereignty. Uh, one of the interesting things in, about the Convention on Biological Diversity is that it recognized for the first time that individual countries uh, have and should have sovereignty over their own biodiversity, over the plants and animals. So uh, no longer can any institution go and collect uh, plants and animals uh, from another part of the world without specific permission, uh, specific uh, uh, licenses and uh, informed consent from from the authorities and indeed from local people in many cases. And that's so important because it, it means that anything that is done now is in partnership. And when you think about bringing, uh, starting or maintaining collections, it, it means that if you do any work on them in the United States or whatever, under that convention, you are obliged to share the benefits from that work with the, the, the country of origin or the region of origin. And, and I think that that is a really good principle that we can apply to what we're doing in botanic gardens and in museums. One of the one of the great things that museums have is to is to be able to make the link between the uh, the art and other objects and how it relates to our own lives. I I find one of the great ways of explaining the importance of plants is to talk about some of the objects that are made from plants and how they have shaped lives both in the past and today. And uh, so, really, museums have uh, uh, have a a great responsibility and opportunity to show how uh, we can achieve sustainability by demonstrating art objects, by de demonstrating uh, craft work, by, by, by holding and making available to communities uh, some of the traditional knowledge that they may even have lost. When we do research on traditional knowledge relating to plants, the primary responsibility is to make sure that that knowledge is in the hands of the people to whom that knowledge belongs. Uh, and if it makes it into, with their permission, into scientific journals and the literature, fine. But that's not, that's not the first responsibility. We need to make sure that that knowledge uh, is in the hands of the people who own it. Uh, and and that's where where we can bring art and science together in some of the museums and gardens uh, that, that do this work really well. Yeah, yeah. Just to kind of piggyback on that, um, you know, I was going to bring up at the end of my talk. I didn't get to it. This great book, um, "How to Do Nothing" by Jenny O'Dell, and she talks and uh, thinks a lot about attention. And the way that you know social media and kind of the the um, the attention economy, as she calls it, um, kind of takes us away from our ability to be present. And um, you know she makes a direct connection between um, our ability to um, focus our attention and to be um, and have that attention turn to awareness, and then our responsibility to something. So when we're able to root down and you focus our attention in on a place, um, on an object, on a space, on an experience, um, we're better able to 
to be aware of how we exist and how we relate to those things and 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 further to feel you know a responsibility to those things as well and so you know i think art museum and botanical gardens give us these great opportunities to to focus our attention to give us these tools of attention mm -hmm. through you know the gallery setup or through you know the um, interpretation and arrangement of plants and they give us this opportunity to develop you know our relationship to a particular place and both you know odell and kimmer um, really connect um, moving away from a consumptive and destructive way of being in the world, they really connect that to a kind of rooting down and a rootedness where you feel, you know, connected to a certain place. And certainly my experience, you know, with the Botanical Garden um, here in Norfolk and at the different wildlife preserves here have really allowed me to feel that connection, you know, to the place. And, um, and to feel a deeper connection here. And so, so I'm more invested, you know, mm -hmm. in this space and, and in fighting for it and doing what needs to be done to conserve, you know, um, to conserve these spaces and to make sure that they're um, around for, for our children um, yeah, and future generations. Did you have anything else you wanted to comment on, Peter, as we're starting to close up? Well, I, I think the I think um, art museums and botanic gardens and all of the institutions that do these sorts of work have a, a great opportunity to to draw people in to be part of them, and to, so the people realise that they that every one of us can leave the world a better place than when we arrived in it, and in some ways that that is our responsibility, and it's. It is. Um, I'm always so uh, touched and uh, and encouraged by the fact that individuals make a difference, and that if we sit back and leave it to others uh, to to make a better world, it won't happen. So every one of us uh, can make that difference, and I and I think it's institutions that can show different face to, to the world and the endless possibilities we have uh, can make that huge difference. And indeed, we have a responsibility to do that. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Brendan. It's just, just I, I feel like this conversation could go for on for a long time, although we build this as an hour long, so I guess we'll wrap it up. But um, it is empowering. It makes us all think really hard about what it is that we do and how we move through this world and how we make beautiful things and leave this place better. Um, I wanted to just really quickly take an opp this opportunity to, to share with the public um, a little bit about this exhibition. If you haven't had a chance to see it yourself, we do have um, a 3D virtual tour, so you can come and check it out yourself on our website. You can go up to every single piece and learn a little bit more about it, either through video or through um, some of the written materials. And in fact, we have more information on the website through the 3D tour than we actually do um, in person. So if you do end up coming through and deciding to look at the 3D tour, you'll learn even more um, than you do when you come physically. So if you're on the other side of the world, don't worry, <laughs> you can still participate. Uh, this is actually a Virginia native orchid, which we have a really interesting piece written about um, by Dr. Lisa Wallace, who we partnered with to develop the exhibition. Um, I'm just going to quickly sort of walk you through here so you guys can see uh, Brendan Baylor's work um, in person here and over here. Um, as you'll see soon, next month we're having a, a conversation with the artists that created this massive installation here, which is comprised of um, dried orchids, real live pollinator species that have been um, dried and then pinned to the wall scientifically. Um, it's really an extraordinary installation. Um, and so I'm just gonna sort of click through here just a tiny bit more so you guys can see. And then our final, final um, talk of the series, which will be coming at the very, very end is with the, uh, the curator from the Harvard Museum of um, Natural History, who we, works with the Balashka collection, um, speaking specifically about this these particular um, models, these scientific models that were created back in the 1800s um, by the Balashkas. They're made out of glass of all things. And they were really interesting historical models because um, rather than press a plant or take a specimen, um, they were sort of conservators before conservators where they were just making replicas, which now can live on for perpetuity. And there's a number of artists um, in the show who made work directly in response to these historical pieces. 
So that talk will be bef between um, that curator as well as uh, Deborah Moore, who's an African-American artist who lives and works out of Seattle, Washington. Um, her work is here. So uh, just, just a little bit, thought I would show you guys just a little bit of the exhibition and you guys can check out some more yourself if you'd like to later on. Uh, finally, um, next month, just so you can see a little bit better, here's Jennifer Angus, as well as uh, Ken Cameron. They both work at the University of Wisconsin and they'll be speaking a little bit more. Uh, the museum is open. If you do live nearby, I encourage you to come and see us Tuesday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday and Sunday, noon to 5. Face masks are required. It's a completely touchless experience. So we hope that you'll consider coming in if you live close by. Um, please consider becoming a museum member if you're enjoying all of our wonderful free virtual programs. Your membership allows us to sustain our free exhibitions and programs. And finally, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We really enjoyed having you here. Um, remember that you can share the link to this recording later on. So these, these archives live on and they can reach more people after the live event. So please consider sharing this after the fact. Thank you so much for coming and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you again, Peter and Brendan. Thank you. Bye, thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye, -bye. Yeah.